It's time for your Nooner with Dooner, and it's Friday. What a great day to be alive. Going to kick things off here with a crazy, crazy video I saw yesterday. It's a dog owner's nightmare. Roll this tape right here. This happened in Woodland Hills, Los Angeles. KABC reports heart-stopping video shows the moment, as you see right there, a puppy jumped out of a moving car on the 101 freeway in Woodland Hills and narrowly missed getting hit by traffic. Uh, that whole incident there was caught on a Tesla camera from the driver. As you saw, the dog there is named Sophie. She leaped out of the car. That quick thinking truck driver, little cowbell for him. He doesn't run this dog over. It makes it safely over to the side. The family recovers it. And here's a cool part of this story. The family had been fostering this dog, but because of their connection through this intense incident right here, they've decided to keep Sophie for good. So, wow, great way to start that. And obviously, if the dog got run over. I wouldn't be showing that, of course. Today's show, we got a big one, man. On today's show, we're talking to T-Force Worldwide's Tom Griffin about the increased reliance on automation and the depersonalization of logistics. What's that mean for relationships? What does that mean for ROI and your freight? CSA scores for hours of service have changed. Relies partners Mark Baller gets us compliant with the latest on DOT regulations. The Cents Per Mile podcast team comes to blows on what the trivia as Charles Gracie and Paul Gibson battled out to see who can take home the crown in our unique spin on supply chain and trucking trivia. It's going to be a blast. We also got some headlines and a lot of news. So let's tip the band and we'll get into it. You may think of AIT Worldwide Logistics as an average U.S. forwarder, but in the past decade, they've evolved to become a global transportation management leader, generating nearly $3 billion in annual revenue by providing supply chain solutions for Fortune 500 companies shipping between Asia, Europe, and North America. Despite the company's exponential growth, they are still the experts when it comes to creating customized solutions to fulfill your supply chain requirements. Find out how your business can benefit from AIT's Logistics Pros at AITWorldwide.com. Let's hit some headlines. Not good ones, not good ones to start off the day. We got Coyote, they're announcing layoffs today, sources say. Sorry to hear that for uh, you Coyotes getting kicked out of the den. Coyote Logistics, they are a wholly owned subsidiary of UPS. They're expected to announce the layoff of approximately 200 people. It was not immediately clear where the layoffs will occur. At the end of January, rumors spread that layoffs would be concentrated on Coyote's large enterprise operations teams. Uh, the staff were dedicated to Coyote's largest shipper accounts. E. You know, for a while, this was just all in tech. It was just all in tech. Now we're seeing it... Um, we're seeing in some of these greater supply chain companies. So hopefully rates and the market pick back up. If you're impacted by this, let me know. Happy to share out to the network and help any of these coyotes land where they need to go. T Dooner at FreightWaves.com. Another big news here. Norfolk Southern commits to Ohio community following that big derailment that happened there. However... People aren't taking it so well, right? Norfolk Southern pledged to keep residents informed about progress on the investigation of the fiery derailment of one of their trains near East Palestine, Ohio. The railroad CEO said Thursday um, in a comment, he put out this, this big missive and he said, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to have happen. But here's what the community had to say. Southern Railman said, then why didn't you all show up to that press meeting last night like you should have? There was a big town hall that they had in the town a few days ago. They told Norfolk Southern to come down there. They wanted to know what kind of reparations were happening, what was happening to, to clean up the water, and what were they doing with the EPA, and was it safe to be there? And why aren't they there? Do they not feel safe there? They said they had safety concerns because they were afraid of, like, I don't know, vigilante justice, but I think that the townspeople's safety concern is what's actually happening in the town. Um, Hapo Lachina says, because they know the area is too dangerous to enter and breathe the air. Then they blame the townspeople, claim they were afraid of violence. It's disgusting. Mary Pizzullo, let's see what she has to say. She says, you treat 
Appalachia like your public toilet. This time there was a mushroom cloud, so people outside Appalachia noticed. She's saying issues like this through Norfolk Southern happen in Appalachia all the time. Um, Cal says, I keep seeing this $1 million. Are the residents supposed to be thankful for that? Cash flow of $2 billion last year, over $1 billion of dividend payouts. Are people supposed to be thankful you deposited $1 million into a support fund? What do you think? Is Norfolk Southern doing enough? Is the government doing enough? Is Ohio doing enough? I know a lot of people are irate about this incident. I think there's a lot of questions that this calls up, especially when it comes to to maintenance. Rachel Premack just put an article yesterday talking about uh, the heat breaks that they worked against. They, they They worked to not have them installed on trains for safety reasons. Big issue here, and I don't think we're done with it. And I think people are going to continue to hold their feet to the flames as maybe they rightfully should. People want a personal approach in logistics. People want to see people and to understand them. And we're in interesting times. A lot of digitization going around. This year, especially with all the talk about AI, Sydney, uh, the, the chat bot with the emotional issues. We got chat GPT. It's all out there. But what does all that mean for supply chain, right? Let's talk to Tom Griffin, president at T-Force Worldwide. And we're going to talk about automation and the depersonalization of logistics. Tom, thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, <clears throat> thanks uh, very much for having me. Glad hey, we share here. we share some blood, too. We're both former uh, Purple Promisers yeah. with FedEx. Yeah, I was uh, with the Custom Critical Group uh, for about five years, way back in the day. And, uh, yeah, a great organization. In fact, uh, their LTL division is uh, one of our key uh, providers. You know, sure. Trump. Tom, this, this this talk right here about the depersonalization of logistics, it's been it's been raging ever since the concept of freight tech came out. You've always had people who go, well, it's a business of relationships. You need you need one on one interaction, all of that. But let's start at the pros, right? What are some of the pros of automating logistics? Um, speed. I mean, it's all about the customer experience and all of our investment, you know, through the 16 years that we've been a platform has been through our connect uh, CMS and uh, basically customers want to be able to come in and control their options. And in terms of getting a rate shop done, booking a shipment, tracing a shipment, looking back in history and what they did, you know, with a repeat, you know, type lane, um, they want to do it in five seconds or less. And that's, that's really been, you know, what we've been focused on in terms of automation Um, from a, invoicing or a billing standpoint, you know, you've got to use tool, tools out there. We use Hubtran, but it doesn't always work. And we do have a staff of about 200 people that, uh, you know, are backing things up when automation isn't working with an outside vendor or we've got to go search. You know, we haven't gotten an EDI invoice from a carrier and sometimes you got to pick up the phone. No, I hear you. You know, it's, I, I've booked freight, I've done entries, and I've sold freight. In every one of those processes, there's a ton of just repetitive tasks, things that you're like, man, it would be yeah. so much easier if I didn't have to hit tab 37 times just to get over into this entry screen. Where are you seeing the biggest ROI in automation? What is making customers the happiest? Um, I think in, in terms of our ability to store their information for them, um, is one key aspect where, you know, companies, you know, make big investments, um, when they really don't have to, and they might be using, you know, multiple platforms, you know, with what they're doing. But, um, in terms of, it's not, you know, eliminating personnel, it, it's making people, you know, a little smarter, you know, let, you know, they don't have to focus on the mundane, but they can, you know, get creative in terms of the, additional options that, you know, we provide, you know, through the TMS. Interesting. You know, a lot can go wrong in freight. And I think that's one of the things that scares some people about automation. What are, what are the pratfalls? Uh, The pitfalls, you mean? Um, Basically, you know, the auto tendering aspect, um, I get a lot of feedback on that. Uh, We do LTL, we do truck load, we do freight forwarding. Um, we probably do around 5,000 LTL shipments per day. And in most cases, 92% of the time, the customer is picking their own carrier. Um, But since we don't auto tender, the operations that are backing that customer up 
we'll see that they've picked a carrier. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. The ops people know that, hey, that carrier is not going to be have a truck in that area. And then we will, you know, change the tender, confirm that a carrier is going to be able to pick up those four skids, communicate back to the customer. So there's hands on every shipment uh, or eyes. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, my station agents, you know, would prefer that we auto tender. Uh, we still haven't. There, with LTL, for instance, there's just too many things that could go wrong. <clears throat> so when the customer, you know, picks whatever carrier they're choosing, um, there's somebody in our operations teams that will approve that tender. So, uh, and I don't know of another platform that does that. Most platforms will you know, simply auto tender, but in the LTL arena, you just can't do that. A miss, a miss pickup is probably the worst thing that can happen any any given day. Interesting. And, you know, and how does that create the, the depersonalization? And I, I know we all, you know, whenever you have an issue and if you can't get tended to or you're tended to by some chat bot with no answers, it's incredibly frustrating. What's the solution here? How do we how do we keep that human element in there and, and merge it to this sort of digital uh, uh, help? I mean, it's really a hybrid. You know, you've got to have the, the personnel that know the industry. They know the carriers. They can actually reach a terminal manager, you know, at, at a touch of a button. Um, and, you know, because I would say one out of four shipments is not going to just, you know, go the automated way. And you've got to have that intervention and make sure that you're watching, you know, basically every shipment that that customer has and basically have the personnel to deal with the exceptions. Interesting. Interesting. What does that look like? What does that look like in action? You got any best practices? Um, best practices, absolutely. Um, we take suggestions from our entire field. And we've, you know, done something a little different. We don't have a, a huge call center. We've got locally based agents out there that, uh, you know, I might have, you know, Mike up in Milwaukee or, you know, Bill out in Pittsburgh. Um, they actually can go out to a customer's, you know, office and basically, you know, walk them through the TMS, you know, versus doing something on, you know, online. Customers then can, you know, provide immediate feedback and they can get with, you know, our integration team, you know, back here in Chicago and say, hey, you know, what do you think about this? And we're employing and, and launching best practices every week. Very cool. Anything else new at yeah. Force Worldwide? Um, yeah, we're continually investing in Connect, TFWW Connect. Um, we're probably going to sign a, a new intermodal partnership with uh, a little company down in Phoenix, Arizona today. Uh, we predominantly use three you know, providers today, but uh, I was out in Phoenix last week and uh, you know, cut through some paperwork there met directly with the vendor and their team and uh we'll we'll launch that uh as as we improve our truckload and intermodal offering within the tms very very cool well people who want to learn more about that yeah. where would i send them to uh www.tfiwwi.com very cool well hey tom thanks you have a great weekend thanks for coming on the show and telling us a little bit about removing that depersonalization from logistics but still using automation yeah Take care. Thanks for having me. Meanwhile, take a look at this. Our brand new balloon defense program instituted by the U.S. Air Force so they don't have to spend $400,000 shooting down a $12 balloon in the Yukon Territory. Just throw some port collies out there, bring them up high enough, strap a jet back to them, and I think we have our solution. I love a good border collie, but I heard they're even. Do any of you out there own a border collie? I have black labs, and you know they obviously have a reputation for being really rambunctious. But I heard border collies are like even worse if they're not outside in a field, like chasing sheep around or you know attacking spy balloons. You're like you'd forget it, they'll eat your couch. So I don't know. I haven't got one yet. They're super smart though. I love them. I want to play a little frisbee dog with those. In the meantime, though, let's talk to Mark Baller. He's the director of DOT regulatory compliance at Reliance Partners. And he's here to help me with a topic that's always a little bit confusing. It's CSA scoring. Hey, Mark, how you doing? I'm doing well, and yourself? 
I am I'm doing good. And you know, I had you on recently and you kind of explained to me some of the things that CSA scores cover and and what they mean and how they're calculated. But there's about seven aspects to it, isn't there? Before we even get into the topic, how do we even calculate that CSA score? <laughs> well, FMCSA uh, actually publishes all of this information uh, through their methodology uh, system. Um, there is a PDF out there that everyone should download. It explains exactly how the scores are calculated and what uh, each violation, uh, the point value is for, for the safety measurement system methodology. If you do a Google search for uh, FMCSA SMS methodology, you should be able to download that document right now. Yeah, and you know, it covers quite a few things. Unsafe driving, hours of service compliance, crash indicator, driver fitness, hazardous material compliance, controlled substances and alcohol, and even vehicle maintenance. But one of the things we're going to touch on today is CSA scores and hours of service compliance. But whenever we have to get into numbers here, like 395.24D, uh, it's above my pay grade. So what does all that mean? What is this new regulation about? Well, the regulation has always been there, but CSA system always scored the failure to transfer your ELD record up to FMCSA as a zero point violation, which means it didn't affect your safety score. They changed that and now they added a point value to it. It is now worth three points um, against hours of service if we cannot transfer our driver's record of duty status up to FMCSA from our ELD. And this is pretty significant because what happens here is not only can we get hit with that one violation, but that could lead to several other violations, which really hits hard for the hours of service. So if we can't transfer our record of duty status because we don't know how, Everybody's required to have an instruction sheet to show this. If they don't have the instruction sheet, that's a violation. That's one point. Fair to put the file comment that the officer tells you into the uh, comment section to do the transfer, that's a point value. That's one point. So three plus one plus one is five. That's the same as not having an ELD in your vehicle. So I got a question here. How do ELDs transmit the data? If I understand, isn't it usually like over Wi-Fi? Doesn't it transmit it itself? How would you have a failure? Well, there's several things. One is if you don't know how to do a transfer. Two, you don't put in the file comment correctly and the officer can't find it. Mm. Now, there, the main uh, ways to do the file transfer is through wireless web services. That's what most every law enforcement ag agency wants you to do. Wireless web. You can also use email. It's the same type of process. It's just how it gets to FMCSA. It's an email up to FMCSA. It's not an email to the officer. And if you don't put the correct information in there, then it won't make it up there, right? And then there's two other ways. There's a USB, and then there's a um, connecting up to a computer via uh, Bluetooth. Nobody uses that. Nobody. Yeah, I was reading this and it says if a driver cannot display and then in, in parentheses it says or print if the system uses printing rather than the display and cannot transfer the ELD records. And it had, had does someone have a, an ELD with no screen on it that just prints out like a dot matrix printer. Is that even a thing? Uh, it, if there was a system that was out there, they no longer produce the ELD and it's no longer active. So, no, I have not seen one in my career in law enforcement nor have I seen one since uh, I retired back in 2020. And so who is, so? because I, I asked my truck drivers, and these guys were company guys, and I was asking them about CSA scores and stuff, and they're like, you know, we don't really think about this stuff. That's that safety guy talk. So what should truck drivers or safety guys know about this? What do they need to do now? This is what they should do. They should go into their um, binder, and check for a few things. One, make sure you have the instruction sheet on how to do the transfer for the ELD. Have an instruction sheet on what to do during a malfunction for an ELD. Make sure that we have eight blank logbook pages in case our ELD starts to malfunction. We have to recreate our logs using those eight blank logbook pages. And then make sure that we have the manual for the ELD. Each one of those are required for the driver to have in their possession and produce to an officer upon demand. Each one of them carries the point value. Now, if we can't do that, that's four points. If we can't do the transfer, it's another three points. And if the officer really wants to get nitty gritty on stuff, then they put down the heat and put in the file comment. That's another. We're looking at 
what, eight points for this? That's incredible. That's an incredible amount of points for this one aspect of it. Now, we also have to remember, this is important. We compete against people that operate on, under the 150 air mile radius, people that aren't required to have a record of duty status. We're still in the pool with those types of carriers. So we get a few violations for hours of service. We can get into that alert status very, very quickly. So what do I recommend people to do? Get that instruction sheet out and do a transfer. Mm. Nobody's going to look at your log unless they search for what your file comment is. If you put nothing in there, fine. It'll just be in the system for a few days and then it drops off. If you put a silly comment in there, like, you know, test, then it will be in the system for a few days and then it'll drop off. But at least you'll know how to do a transfer. And the ELD normally tells you when that transfer is successful. So these there's the seven categories here that all go into this score, right? And if I understand this correctly, you've got to keep this above 65%. So these things can add up really quickly. How does that work? Yeah. Each category is a little bit different, and it's different if you're a hazmat carrier or a non-hazmat carrier as well. So for our unsafe driving, hours of service, the uh, level to when you hit the alert is 65, same with crashes. Otherwise, it's 80% for vehicle maintenance, driver fitness, hazardous materials. Um, so those are at relatively high, but it is so easy to get into the hours of service Um alert status because again we are competing against carriers a lot of carriers that are short haul which don't have to have elds right all they need is a time record which you don't need to have in the vehicle and they only have to have it at the company and they don't have to produce it upon demand if you ask for it company's got two days to get it to you so but yet we're still hold to you know, we're still competing against those carriers in that one basic. And the way that it all works out, really, is that within the group that you are, where your scoring is in that group, say your score is 65% and in the alert, that means everybody in that group, 65% of those carriers are doing better for hours of service than the company that has that score. If we're at 90%, well into the alert, that means 90% of those companies are doing better than us in that group for hours of service. So how often should companies be reviewing these CSA scores? Pretty frequently, it sounds once, like. Once a month. Once a they month. They should be checking it once a month. They uh, they take the snapshot usually the, on the last Thursday of the month, and then approximately 10 days later, not the following Monday, but the Monday after that is when they normally publish, unless there's a holiday. Then they normally will publish on that Tuesday. Go check them out. Check them out. Uh, Monday afternoon, if they haven't updated the scores, check it out on Tuesday. Always monitor your scores because you never know what's what could happen to put you into the alert, including inspections that have been uh, written to wrong carriers. So if the officer puts down the wrong USDOT number, you could pop into the alert if you were close because of somebody else's inspection that wasn't ours. Oh, wow. So... Before I let you go, any other regulations, rules, uh, safety concerns on the horizon that drivers or carriers should uh, should should be thinking about into the weekend? Um, yes, crashes. Mm. Review your crashes. If you can check this, uh, the crash preventability determination program guide. Check our crashes. If somebody ran into the back end of us, we can data queue those crashes to have that point value removed from that profile. But they're taking upwards of three to four months to get those things taken care of. So the quicker that you do it, the quicker they'll be able to come off of our uh, rating. Interesting. All right. Well, how do people learn more information, Mark? (laughs) <laughs> they can contact me at uh, mark.barler at reliancepartners.com. Excellent. Well, I hope they do. Go check those CSA scores, and you have a great weekend. You too, sir. Take care. Take it easy. All right. Time to tip the band another time over here. We got China, India, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Mexico. AIT Worldwide Logistics has 2,000 supply chain experts in these countries and, of course, in offices across the United States. And in 2023, they're adding more locations around the world as the organization continues to expand and make it easier than ever for customers to ship between Asia, Europe, and North America. If you're ready to create a shipping program as unique as your business, 
as unique as this show. You can learn more at AITWorldwide.com. Boy, Chuck Gracie is in the green room, so I'm going to bring him up because I know he's in Nashville last night at a testing or a tasting. Maybe he was testing some stuff, too. I don't know. Let's bring him up right now. Hot seat services, cents per mile. Uh, probably has a good CSA score and probably never failed a whiz quiz. <laughs> no, I, I couldn't. I studied too hard for those. Right for the whiz quiz? You have to. What, what were you doing up in Nashville? You're here before your, your buddy, so you get a chance to talk a little smack and promote your, uh, your little Nashville trip. Yeah, so we were up in Nashville doing a Tennessee tasting for Hot Seat Services and all of our clients, and uh, it was a great time. We were up there enjoying the scenery, enjoying some good bourbon, some good food, and then I had to rush back so I could be on the show. Well, excellent. Well, how have things been? How's the recruiting market been uh, been going? What does it look like for drivers right now out there? You, you know, it's unique because things that historically have happened are not following the same trend. So drivers are being more selective in where they're going. Drivers are vetting out their offers and carriers are having to honor those offers that they made when prices were really good and now they're not so good. Interesting. So well, is it easy to place drivers right now or is it becoming tougher because the pay isn't as enticing? Uh, no, it's easy if you're being real with the drivers. The drivers are doing their homework, which is great. It's something that uh, should have been happening all along. They're doing their homework. They're checking the reviews. They're talking to other drivers. They're vetting out the recruiters even. Uh, so it's nice to see the industry going in that direction. Uh, the more genuine offers are going to win. If you're focused on your culture, if you're focused on your pay, if you're focused on that internal growth for the organization and including your drivers in that plan, you're going to win. Well, I'm glad you are winning out there. How about on cents per mile? You know, you're going to take on your co-host. You're going to beat him. You're you're going to embarrass him. But what other, what kind of conversations, what kind of verbal sparring have you been doing lately on cents per mile? Which you people out there, look it up wherever you get your podcast, cents per mile. Yeah, no. So we're having a great time with it. Uh, you know, Paul and I are really good friends. Uh, so it makes it really fun to do this together. Uh, we both have really good companies behind us that are helping us along the way with this. And uh, we just started our little uh, segment where we're bringing mystery carriers and kind of playing off that old wine dating show game and letting them pitch their offer without a name attached to it. And then the drivers rate that and then they unveil who they are. So it's it's giving them a chance to get their offer out there and be graded just on that alone. Oh, it's like a love connection. Like, uh, you know, yeah. interesting story. You know, Chuck, we're going into trivia. Here's a little trivia for you. Chuck Worley was the host of Wheel of Fortune. Did you know that before Pat Sajak? And he went. It might be a little bit for my time. He went to the pro. Well, me too. But that doesn't mean you can't read history books on game shows. He he, he wanted to get paid more, right? So he and he ended up going over to the Love Connection, and then Pat Sajak jumped into his grave over on the Wheel of Fortune. And now he's still there all these years later, spinning that that wheel around with Vanna White, who, by the way, has never worn the same dress twice. That's a lot of dresses. That I'd love to see that wardrobe just for a post. Well, before we bring Paul up, why why are you going to beat Paul today? Why is he a tomato can? Well, <laughs> so I'm actually on team Paul on this one. He has got a wealth of random knowledge. So I'm the underdog in this one. I'm just hoping I make it out with my integrity intact. Well, your opponent is here. He's, he's in the green room. Let's bring him up. Paul, what's happening, brother? Not much. Ready to go. Ready to go. <laughs> I, I love Even that. the younglings. Let's it's, do this. It is not a chainsaw, but a lightsaber will do. I think it can do more damage oh. out in the wild. I got the I got the chainsaw too. I like the props. I, that. I like the props. Where'd fun. you? So we I was at Disney World um, in March last year. Thank you, um, mm -hmm. thank you, Grandma. Thank you, Grandpa. Uh, it was a great time. But we made our own lightsabers at uh, Savvy's Workshop. Myself and my two boys. Oh yeah, yeah. I uh, so we went. Uh, that's actually where I got that that Darth Vader lightsaber. Uh, so we actually went, and it was it was filled up already. Uh, I was so bummed. It's I wanted to get that like. That kit that has like the raincore tooth at the bottom of the hilt, like that, I was all about it. That's the one I got. That's my saber, dude. What? That's the, and then I had to go get, but yeah. I had to buy because they only the kyber crystals. They give you purple, green, or red, I think, and blue. But they didn't have yellow, and they got yellow in the gift shop. Mm -hmm. So with the raincore hilt, you kind of need the yellow. But then Ray got the yellow, and I don't know. I'm not as, as cool on it anymore. <laughs> Maybe in like my head cannon, I have killed Ray, and I've taken her kyber crystal, and now it is my lightsaber. Yeah. Her being a Palpatine kind of turned out weird. That was a weird way to do things. Well, hey, Paul, before we get into trivia, who are you? Why are you the opponent here? Why are you facing off against Chuck? Uh, well, um, 
I am Charles's co-host on Sense Per Mile. Um, we initially met. Uh, I ran Bright Lights Media. Um, I basically make videos for the trucking industry, um, and I try to make them funny uh, in a way that drivers actually enjoy the entertainment and don't feel like they just wasted their time watching an infomercial. <laughs> well, perfect. All right. Well, hey, it's time to get. Oh, wait. Why? Why? Why are you gonna beat Chuck? Um. Uh, I, am I? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not totally confident. Okay. Um, Charles. Charles is a great opponent. Uh, but I think. I think it really ultimately is going to depend on what comes down the pipeline. Uh, if it gets real technical on the freight side of things, I'm great at recruiting. I'm great at trucks. I'm not great at the freight side of things. Uh, but when it comes to random knowledge, um, that is where I. Uh, I, I thrive. Well, good. This is going to be very random. It's what the trivia. It's just as random as this show. Our first question is going to be a 15-question gauntlet today. 15-question gauntlet. If you win, Ooh. you enter the winner's circle. So eventually it'll be a tournament of champions, and we'll have the ultimate. We'll crown the ultimate what the trivia champion. But let's start off at number one. This is a video daily double. No, it's only worth one point. But it is, what did he do wrong here? Play the video. Well, boys, I center a little too fucking hard, bud. I really hope I all. Oh. And we don't have buzzers, so just raise your I hand to answer. Good. We got Chuck. Well, boys. Too fast for conditions. Yeah, he centered too effing hard. He told you right there. I told you that was a warm up. Easy point for Chuck Gracie. Paul is just learning the rules there. Paul likes yeah. to take it slow. He's staging his comeback, and he's. I think he's trying to learn the cadence of of his hand raises over there so he knows how to beat him on the next one. I'm a late bloomer. It's it. just how I've always been. You ever you ever get in a wreck like that? No. No. Not you. Not you. No, Here's no. question question number two. We're, we're going to go into trucking, right? Pretty simple here. What is a Jake break? Oh, we got Paul. We got Paul. Paul was up quicker. Uh, it's it's the engine break that's that slows the truck down. Yeah, it's an engine brake that can be used to slow down a semi. I was actually just write, writing about runaway truck ramps in the What the Truck newsletter. You can go to FreightWaves.com slash WTT and get one of those. You ever had to engage that? You ever find yourself in a scary situation in the truck, Chuck? You utilize those on a regular basis, actually. That's when you hear the truck going down like, wah, 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 wah. Oh, I mean like towards a runaway ramp, though. You ever been in a situation no. where you're burning brakes? No, you don't want to use those. You did no. something wrong if you have to use those. Well, yeah. You end up on What the Truck. Not as a trivia <laughs> cast, as, a, as a video. All right, here, here's, here's a video. And this one, watch very closely. It's another video question. Who's at fault in this video? Got to wait for it to finish playing. Then raise your hands. All right, we got two here. Who's got their hand up? Oh, ooh, that was so close. I'm going to have to go Chuck. Chuck was just a little quicker. So the truck was. Even though the car is coming, the truck has to look and clear because it's on the inside lane. Yeah. It, well, how about this, though? Does the speed factor play into this at all? Because we've heard, like, there were a ton of comments online. A lot of people said, yeah, it looks like the car is the idiot. But when you are a professional truck driver, you have certain responsibilities and you have to make the that lane turn. Like you said, he the problem is he's over in the left lane. He needs to be in the right lane to initiate that turn. What do you do on a wide turn like that, though, Chuck? Like, if you see, he doesn't have much space. And if someone is coming at 70 miles an hour, that can happen. Yeah, I mean, granted, the driver did the best they could do, but you got to always assume everyone else out there is an idiot. And if you do that, then you generally margin on the side of air, and uh, hopefully no one like that comes at 70 miles an hour to make a turn. Paul, you impressed by the wheelie that that, uh, that hatchback pulled? Dude, that was pretty sick. <laughs> uh, but I also think that that was a, a pretty easy one uh, for Charles, just because I feel like drivers are found to be guilty 90% of the time in traffic situations anyway, even when they're not. So... Well, you had the same opportunity. His hand is just quicker than yours. He's got lightning Work. arms. He's got the fastest, fastest <laughs> arms in freight. <laughs> I've been working out leading up to this. He has. He, you were out in Nashville yeah. all night, man. I'm, I, I'm in bed at yeah, like 9 o'clock. Right building that arm muscle for raising my hand right now. <laughs> okay. How about this one right here? And maybe we can give multi points on this one because there's a couple parts to it. Who was the first? Wait, we'll start here. When was the first semi truck invented? You got the year? Ooh. 
first year semi truck was invented. Mm -hmm. Are we talking combination style? The first semi, the, what's considered the first semi truck. Let's go, Paul. I'm gonna throw a hail mary. Yes. Um, 1932. <laughs> yeah. Nineteen eighty-four. Uh, 1984? Nineteen eighty-four. No, eighteen ninety-eight. <laughs> <laughs> you can redeem yourselves. You can redeem yourselves. There's two more parts. Who was it that invented the first semi truck? Where is our trivia music, by the way? It's playing. <laughs> oh, it's there. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't. I don't know. Oh, wait, wasn't it? Didn't Mac? Mac back in ninety seven. It was, it was, it was it Mac. It was Mac. Alex, they made it was, okay, it was Alexander Winton. <laughs> third, third chance. Third chance. Where was? Where did this happen? Well, where did this happen? There is a uh, really bad football team there. Uh, Freightways next event will be happening in this city. Ooh, Detroit. Oh God! You guys just three chances, three eggs, three goose eggs. <laughs> it's Cleveland, Ohio, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame at the end of June. I was close. I was gonna say state. Go to area. Go to live. Go to live. Dot com and get yourself a ticket for that one. Okay. <laughs> this is about abuse of the employees in the industry. What sign is this industry from? And I will read it to you right here. It says, effective immediately, all staff must leave their cell phones on and make themselves available when not on shift. Consider yourself on call. You must answer calls from Gary, and if you are asked to cover a shift, you must do so without complaints. This is not optional. We all need to work together to help this company succeed. Let's set some record profits this quarter. Go team. Signed, Gary. <laughs> it is Charles Gracie. This is definitely logistics. Yes. But, like, which mode of transportation? Oh, this has to be uh, trucking. You know, this is signs that drivers and anyone in logistics see posted on the walls or in the offices next to their cubicles. Yes, yes, we do see these quite often in trucking, especially when you go up to bring some paperwork to the receiver. However, you're wrong, sir. It is not from mm. trucking. Paul, you got it. You want to you wanna take a shot at this one? It's been in the news, this mode of transportation. Uh, is it the uh, is it railroad? It is railroads. Yeah, let's give him a point. <laughs> nice. Let's give nice. him a point. He picked it up. What do you think about Gary? Would you uh like if you you got a driver, you're placing a driver, and you said, hey, I just came for this company with this asshole Gary, who you know I need to call him about everything. <laughs> what do you say, Chuck? I mean, oh, and like a I can tell you what I'd say, but you'd probably have to bleep it out. Go ahead, man. We'll bleep it. <laughs> got to Gary to call. <laughs> okay. Damn, Gary. Paul, you got worse for Gary? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't say anything. Quiet quitting's the thing now, right? That is true. A lot of, <laughs> you know, it took me too long to... No, to... you'd say do better, Gary. That's your thing. Do better. Be better. I'm with you. You know, this logistics is such, like, a small world, though, and it's something, like, I've gotten better at, too, is, like, engaging in, like, fights or, like, trolling or any of that stuff. Like, it, focus on the positive. Just walk away. Just walk away. Like, that. you don't benefit Either... really. Either that, or I would call Gary incessantly and make him pick up my calls. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Gary the snail. Well, here's a, here's one for you guys. You should know this is a little, uh, this kind of typical. What is the average fuel economy of a semi truck? Eight. Oh, I got to raise my hand. Paul's got his hand up. Isn't it like, it's like eight, isn't it? Like pretty close to eight in the newer trucks. Beep that man. Well, you might be closer than Chuck. We'll see. Beep that man, because whoever's closer, I'll give it to. What do you say, Chuck? I'd say uh, seven. You're closer at 6.5 miles to a gallon. Seven if you're you're running pretty nice. Six if you're a little heavy on the hammer. You get good mileage back in the day? You get good mileage back in the day, Chuck? I kind of ride, like, in my Prius, I just, I my wife's Prius, I just bombed that thing down the road. Well, now I just switched to that new truck I bought. From the one that you saw last time, so now I got a V8 and uh, not so good mileage. Ah, uh, feel uh. like I need to invest into a gas station. Kill it! You'll you'll be on this show bankrupt in like six months from your new truck. <laughs> 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 I, don't, I don't wish this upon you. Okay, what what was the estimated cost of the hobbyist balloon that the U.S. Air Force is alleged to have shot down over the Yukon territory? 
Now it's the what Balloon it? Brigade. I don't know if you guys saw this story, and Chuck has his hand up. What wasn't it like uh, 1.7 million to shoot down that thing or something like that? No, what did the balloon itself cost? Oh, yeah. All right. I pull my hand back down. You got a range. You can hit within a range here. Throw out another my forte. So uh, balloons. Go ahead. Paul. Small pico balloon. Yeah, I'll just I'll just take a guess at it. Uh, Three hundred and sixty thousand. No, it was twelve to one hundred and eighty dollars. This balloon that we shot with what? a four hundred a four hundred thousand dollar Sidewinder missile. So I don't know if you caught this story yesterday, but there's this balloon, like uh, this balloon enthusiast club. I, I didn't even know there were balloon enthusiasts, but apparently there are. And these balloon enthusiasts were sitting around, and they're like. Oh no, man! Like they're shooting down these Chinese spy balloons. Balloons are balloons are on the radar. So they try to warn, like the Pentagon this is what these guys are saying. They're like, "Hey, look! There's there's tons of balloons everywhere. There's all these unregulated weather balloons. In fact, you know we have one that's that's coming across. And the problem is these balloons they they're unregulated if they weigh under I think it's six pounds. And they send them up, and they basically just have solar sensors on them that can send out like a, a minor ping, but. If that sensor's dead or they have no battery, they can't. So the U.S. Air Force is like, oh, no, we got to, like, flex and take out a balloon to show strength so we didn't get pants. But then they missed with the first missile, and w then they hit it with the second. But all, I guess it's more impressive now that it was that small of a balloon. I'm not sure it's impressive. There was, a, like, some massive miscalculations in shooting down that balloon. What if it was grandma on a hot air balloon? Bad timing. Bad time, bad time, bad time. I just wish we could go back to like a week ago and we thought they were all UFOs. I, I like that. I well, look, I'm not out on that theory. I'll tell you something. So I was watching uh, this YouTube video on incidents of you because all these videos have come out on, on unidentified flying objects. And there's a report from from um, Southern California from 2004 about unidentified flying objects, like three reports I'm going, I was on the beach out there when I used to live out there with my buddy Wong, and I know it was like three in the morning and we might not have been in the right condition, but we saw this orange object, it was going straight, and all of a sudden it went boom, like that, and just zoomed across, and it just moved like nothing can move. So not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens, no, but like there's stuff flying around up there, gotta look out for. Didn't we like acknowledge aliens though when we had the same year as the murder hornets and everything else? I, I, yeah, and I think it, there was just so much going on. We couldn't take it all in. He <laughs> got lost in all of that. He <laughs> got lost. You don't know what to believe anymore. You got to pick and choose. All right. Wait, do you guys have any weird hobbies, by the way? Do you have any, like, a balloon or, like, uh, do you guys play with um, ham radios? Like, my buddy, <laughs> my buddy from G-Captain, John Conrad, he goes up on, like, the mountains and talks on a ham radio. Nope. That's a lot Zero. of work. That is a lot of work. I, I do Boy Scouts and martial arts. I'm pretty lame, other than you know the cool camping trips and all that fun jazz. Pretty, pretty I just, interesting. Yeah, I pretty much just play guitar and mod video games. So That's you, it. so your last name is Gibson. Any relation to the Gibson family? No, I got. I have a couple of them though. Oh, you do. What? So what? What is? <laughs> are you like a Les Paul guy? What do you got back there? Yeah, uh, it turned out to be pretty uh, ironic that my favorite choice of guitar happened to be a Gibson Les Paul. But yeah. I mean, I, if there was, like, a famous Dooner guitar that was just as good as, like, Fender, I would probably be playing a Dooner myself as well. <laughs> now, Chuck, you are going to have maybe an advantage in this question. It is in recruiting. It's right in your wheelhouse, and it's a video question. How often does this happen in recruiting? I held it a couple of times, but nobody got back to me. Oh, what's this? A love letter? Ah, funny. No, man. It's actually my two weeks notice. Oh, what? No way. Really? You know what? The job is just not for me. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. We really enjoyed working with you. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I'm just going to check your records quickly before I put in your termination notice. Okay, sounds good. Everything should be all clear anyways. Mm, not sure about that, Mike. What do you mean? Well, remember you broke down two weeks ago because of your tire explosion? Yeah, why? That wasn't my fault. I have to put that on your record as property damage. Seriously? Yeah, man. I'm sorry. This will come out of your last paycheck. No, I don't agree to that. How much was it? Can't say. I don't know. I got to confirm with accounting. What do you need to confirm with accounting? I got to confirm how much is coming off your pay. Coming off my pay, zero. I'm a company driver, my friend. I don't need to pay for any of this stuff. We deem that as driver negligence, so it's going to be coming out of your pay. Your equipment deemed me as driver negligence? Yeah, we'll see how far you get with that. Anyways, it is what it is. It's not my decision to make, so uh, you'll have to take it up with the boss. And now you know why I gave my notice. As a matter of fact, you know what? I quit immediately, as of now. Later.
All right, how often does that happen? Chuck has his hand up. <laughs> <laughs> that happens almost 98% of the time with the 1099 carriers that itemize everything that happens on that truck. I've even seen some of them itemize sunspots and charge the driver. Wow, so it's like worse than moving out of an apartment with a bad landlord. Like they are just gonna ding you on on everything. And is this this comes out the last everything. paycheck they're supposed to send you? Yeah, so they actually, most 1099 carriers have a escrow. It's kind of common practice. Generally, the driver knows they're never going to see that escrow. Now, there are some good ones where you'll get it back, but that's where it comes down to doing your research and where you're going. Wow. You, it, Ric Flair, he had, like, he, when he had the WCW championship, and I think it was the NWA championship, some, he had to have put escrow on that belt. Then when he went to the WWF, they wouldn't give him his deposit back. So he took the title with him, and he was wearing it, like, on TV. It was, uh, it was, a, it was a whole... Uh, it was a whole big thing. What's the biggest horror story? Like, what is the most you've heard someone get dinged on one of these things? Like, they quit the job and all of a sudden. So generally, they're... escrows can range anywhere from fifteen hundred to five grand, depending on the carrier. Um, there's usually a contract with it. Um, a lot of the ten ninety nine carriers exercise this where the owner operators and lease drivers are used to it. But ten ninety nine company drivers, this is one of the most common issues they come across. Uh, I've seen ones get dinged for sunspots or tires blowing out, which is just general wear and tear. Well, that's a point for Gracie. It's a point for Gracie. Gibson, you uh, you you have any horror stories from that side? Um, yeah. I mean, so I travel the country and work with trucking companies all the time uh, and interview drivers. And I've seen it happen. I've even seen drivers, um, basically their entire escrow and their last check goes to detailing the truck and buying a new mattress for the next driver that'll be in that truck. So it's not that there's oh, anything even wrong with the truck. They've just got to. They charge them all of the money they have coming to them or that's theirs to say like, oh, we got to clean it. We got to get it that new truck smell. Sorry, man. You're out. Ugh. I've seen one where a driver got a bill after they cleaned out their escrow. They sent uh, them a bill for the remainder. It's like worse than Airbnb now, you know, it's coming to charge, <laughs> charge out the ass for nothing, man. All right. Mm -hmm. Time. I hope you drank your smart juice this morning. It's time for a little bit of math. All right. I'm going to test in all phases of your intellect over here. Pay close attention to this video. Is this ball right here? I love him. I love him. <laughs> Please. Uh, just two. Thank you so much. <laughs> Have a good day. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, good cut. Yeah, it just multiply. All right, so great roadside cotton candy right there. The math is how much is the cost per cotton candy? <laughs> Paul's got his hand up. <laughs> was it five dollars? You're right. It was five dollars for cotton candy, but she ended. I guess maybe it was like two fifty though, right? She bought two, yeah, and then she also just got four. Her up. I know. <laughs> she ends up with like four at the end. What is well, your? It, I was about to say, he never said the price, but she handed him a 20, asked for two, but he still gave her four. Well, I thought, I thought it was two fives. I had been examining that, that video That's very closely. I thought, I thought $10. Yeah, I brought it to the CSI lab. I know fives are starting to get rare. You don't see them as often, but I think she, uh, she slipped him a couple five spots, then he hooked her up pretty well. Mm. You guys, when I used to live in Southern California, those roadside things came in handy because you get like oranges, you get nuts. If you had a you had a girl waiting on you, you could grab a little rose or something. Are you guys purveyors of the uh, the roadside merchant? So originally I'm from Chicago and they have them everywhere. Uh, uh, you'd be surprised what you can get. You can get Gatorade. They had coolers out there. It was convenient when I was driving a truck. Interesting. What's the best thing you bought from someone on the side of the road without getting arrested, Charles? That's I mean, like a uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you know, the most risky was taking a hot dog from one of those, but I was really Ooh. hungry and um, my dispatcher wouldn't let me stop because it was a just in time load. <laughs> Never good when you get the runs. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, all right, now we got a little true crime. I told you, we're going the whole gamut here. Name the serial killer known as the Night Stalker who terrorized San Francisco and Los Angeles from 1984 to 1985. Netflix has made several documentaries about this man. Had the pentagram on his hand. No, no I'm not raising my hand. I'm... 
<laughs> Paul's like, please enlighten me. Uh, uh, Paul's not sure. Wild guess, just name a serial killer. What serial killers do you know, Paul? Um, <laughs> was it Charles Manson? I get well, no, because he didn't kill anybody. No, okay. He just convinced other people to kill people. Yes, and that was a uh, nineteen. <laughs> that was that was nineteen sixty nine. No, this was the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez. Richard Ramirez, total creep. You want to know more about him? There's a yeah. there's a good doc on Netflix. It was a really good book. What is it called? I think it's just called Night Stalker. All right. Now here you guys have to. Here's one for you. Will this man make this jump first? Here is the man and the challenge, and we're gonna stop it before he jumps, and you guys can decide if he will or he won't. So play the tape. Doctor Shortage. One foot. It's gonna be a stretch for you. You ain't. You ain't frog hopping that. What do you mean? You ain't two like feet. Like that? That's frog hopping. You ain't frog hopping. Why not? It's like six feet. You frog hopping at 255 and 50 years old is gonna be something. And if you frog hop, you're gonna fall straight the f backwards. I guarantee you. I will fall straight. The f backwards. <laughs> Can we do a steak dinner bit? <laughs> All right, stop, stop the tape. Do you think he makes it and wins the steak dinner or not? Uh, you guys don't even have to raise your hand. Just you have to. So Chuck says no. What does Paul say? Uh, does it count if he falls back after he does it? <laughs> he's got, yeah. I mean, he's got to kind of land successfully, somewhat successfully. All right, I'm still, I'm still just. I mean, that guy was willing to put a steak dinner on it, and if it, I, he looks like he's built pretty well, I'm gonna go for it. I think he makes it. All right, and then Charles says, "No way, no way in hell, right?" No, he, he face plants for sure. The guy who's the guy who's warning him is in pretty good shape and looks like he's probably jumped across a few trees before, and you know, he might know his business. But let's see, does he make it or not? Oh. 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 <laughs> nope! <laughs> he did not! Steak dinner right there! <laughs> He's okay, though. Steak dinner right there. I'm not even mad I got that wrong. <laughs> Anytime I get hit in the nuts, I just want someone to yell as I'm like writhing in pain, like, Steak dinner over there! <laughs> that is the best. That look painful. Kick That's a, man. a worker's comp claim later on. Is it real? You ever have someone injure themselves on your site doing something stupid like that, or you injure yourself? Um, that's again, a loaded question, no, but no, um, people get injured doing this job all the time. I mean, I had it one day, uh, getting out of a truck. Uh, I went to catch the door that was getting caught by a windstorm and I should have let it go, but it kind of yanked me out and I was dangling off the side with my foot under the clutch, <laughs> tore my ACL, my oh. meniscus, fractured my tibia. No way. No yeah. way. Did someone yell steak dinner? Is <laughs> steak dinner on no. <laughs> No, but it, people look rather than come and try to help the guy dangling from the side of the sunlight. People just kind of stood there and looked and like, look at this rookie. I'll tell you something. Before I broke my ankle, like, I thought I was invincible. I'd never broken a bone before. And I'll tell you something. I had to get, like, two screws in there. And it was the stupidest thing. Like, my brother-in-law like, picked me up in this bear hug, and he just brought me down too fast. I wasn't prepared. And, like, my, my, just all my weight came down on my ankle. It just split to the side. It sucks. My, I got that ACL thing, too. You have trouble getting that calf back up? back up to size no it, it took a while i mean i was told i was going to be out of work for almost 13 months and I, I was back in seven but it took a lot of work all right next question we're, we're, we're running short on time released in 1991 what was tupac's first album <laughs> oh man no. i'm trying to think of all his album names. named after a great vietnam war movie sort of with a Tupacian spin. We're gonna have to buzz him. Bam! It's Tupacalypse now. How about this though? Another video question. What is this used for in a truck? Man, y'all ever seen one of these right here? These things are lifesavers. Let me tell you. <laughs> the ball has got his hand up. It's when you don't when you don't have a toilet. Yeah, so you, let's let's play the tape here. Give him a point and play the rest of that. So you get your hand right, up let me show the you video stops playing. So the first thing you got to do, you got to grab your trash can. User. Then what I usually like to do is take two grocery bags, stick them in my trash can, fold it over. And the next thing you do is I take my toilet seat, I unfold it, and I just plop it right down all over it. Oh no! And then when it's all ready to demo. go. Throw your pants down, sit down, do your business. Y'all think this is a joke, but I tell you what, man, there ain't nothing like being somewhere where you ain't near a bathroom. It is a lifesaver, I'm telling you. Instead of sitting on your DOT bumper 
while everybody's passing by and honking at you, you're inside the cab with privacy. If you like this, you can grab one from my link. A must have, right? I want a bag of shit. Well, like, you is just it a lifesaver. You just throw it at the Tesla driving next to you. Uh, <laughs> instead, of, instead of sitting on your DOT bumper, that's what got me. The feds charged former, the feds charged this guy right here, former Slink CEO Chris Kirchner in a fraud scheme worth how many millions of dollars? Look, there he is hitting his stupid golf balls. $67 million, 67, big time. All right, one last question for you right here to determine the winner because it's tied. Closest wins, seven day spot rate average inclusive of fuel, dry van. What is it today? Guess a number. You got five seconds. Any number. That's all you, man. Can you do it? Can you do it, Charles? <laughs> you all know. have to guess a number. Hurry up. 36. $2.44. We're giving to Chuck Gracie. He's the winner of What the Trivia. Thank you guys for joining on this show. Find me on Twitter at Timothy Dooner. Look What the Truck up wherever you get your podcasts. I'll catch you Monday.